And the reason that we're not talking about this is because the threshold is under 150,000 deaths. It's not enough because the American public is so desensitized that 150,000 deaths isn't going to make enough of a difference. And I think back to my childhood when MAD was created because one woman lost her daughter. And that's where all of us mothers come together. And I think that with the power of social media like TikTok and women realizing that it's just not our situation, it's every woman's situation. This is the One Girl Revolution podcast, a podcast that highlights the stories of world-changing women and girls across the country. We hope that these stories inspire you But even more so, we hope that these stories help you to see your own value, your purpose, and your power to change the world through your life. Every woman and girl is a one girl revolution. On this week's episode of the One Girl Revolution podcast, we welcome Gwen Brown, a mother, a writer, and an activist fighting the fentanyl epidemic. In this episode, you'll hear the heartbreaking story of how Gwen lost her teenage son to fentanyl. It's still raw and painful for Gwen to talk about as we're coming up on just the one-year anniversary of Laird's death. But Gwen is a powerful voice, a beacon of light in the darkness, and she has decided to use her own pain and her own heartbreak to help others. And now she's becoming one of the leading activists fighting this epidemic, raising awareness and training parents, individuals, and families on how to combat this crisis in their own families and their own communities. As Gwen says in this episode, the fentanyl epidemic is not over there. It's rampant in your own community, your own family, and is among the people you know and love. You do not want to miss this powerful and inspiring episode, and we need you to speak up and to get involved in this crisis. So together we can bring an end to overdoses of fentanyl and other lethal drugs in our world. Here's my conversation with Gwen. Gwen, welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. I am so honored and so excited to have you on. You are such a powerhouse of a woman, and I'm just so inspired by you, so inspired by your story. You are a mother, a writer, an activist now fighting the fentanyl epidemic. And I want to talk to you about your son, what happened to him, and how you ended up becoming this one girl revolution. And I know you're still becoming, I believe that we are always becoming who we were created to be fighting the fentanyl epidemic. But before I get into that, before we get into that part of your story, I would love to have you rewind and just share a little bit about who you are, where you're from and your life before becoming a mama. (laughs) Um, So I, I was actually born in DC in the district of Columbia. Uh, which I think is kind of special. Not a lot of people can claim that. And I lived in the D.C. area, in uh, Southern California, uh, Western New York, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and then back to California. And went to school in New York, went to school in California, and drifted between working in nonprofits for as long as I could. And I got a really great education in in the nonprofit world. And then when I needed to go ahead and and actually make a good salary, then I would move to uh, technology. So I have this balance between technology and nonprofit uh, that I worked in for about 10 years before my first child and continued um, over, over my entire career. Once we moved to North Carolina, we had this perfect storm of events in our lives that occurred that I believe led to Laird's death. We moved here after the start of the school year because my daughter was in competitive gymnastics, in serious competitive gymnastics in California. And so we wanted to wait until the season was over. 
she did very well, but unfortunately she lost uh, an extremely close friend the day that she was at uh, state. And she's learning how to grieve and we don't know how to help her grieve because, you know, while we've lost adults, they've been, they've been adults. And it's a whole different thing when it's a child. Uh, it's unimaginable. And that was my first taste of the unimaginable. And I still didn't get it. I didn't get it. And once we moved out here to North Carolina to Charlotte area, the pandemic happened within three months. So now the kids who have gone to their new schools for hardly at all and haven't had a chance to make friends, they're in a new place. They don't have any friends. They're locked down. My daughter's mental health spiral down into some serious issues and Laird you know frequently while I was working had to keep an eye on her that you know she didn't have anything sharp near her and that was a big burden for him um now my older son at that time he he had moved out he's a wildland firefighter now a hot shot in California super proud of him so he was adulting in California during this time phase. So it's just the two littles is what I call them. So I think that for both of them, they're spiraling down. And then unfortunately, my uh, husband and I got divorced during that time period. And so that's another big break for the kids. My daughter is experiencing incredible bullying and struggling with her own mental health. And Laird is trying to, Laird is, is the most sensitive human he can walk in the room and immediately know the emotional center of the room and so he's feeling all the feels that are happening he's also on the autism spectrum so i think that that this is heightening his his eq and his understanding of what's going on and he's very internal about how he processes and so this is the start of his processing so now we have two households and there's no arguing between the adults, but it's still hard on the kids. And Laird started finding himself at the high school and joined the wrestling team and started to understand the social aspect of high school. And the year before he died, the entire summer, he was just, he was a boy's boy. He was gone all the time. He was, and and now, of course, looking back, I'm wondering what he was really doing. But to me, he was fishing. He was jumping in the lake on a rope swing. He was with his friends on the lake. He was camping out and eating hot dogs on a stick on a fire. <laughs> you know, things that boys, that I wanted for him, you know, to have this, life where he could run around and do these things with really close friends. And the majority of his really close friends, I, I really liked. His closest friends, I absolutely adored. Still do. Great kids. And of course, they struggle really hard now, you know, and it has been brutal for them to have been there that night, to have found him that day. You know, there are some kids that are just not getting over that. That are, mm. And there's no way to get over it, but they're just not processing from that moment in time. They're stuck right there. And it's a horrible place to be stuck. Yeah, it's so horrible. And even like what you shared about even the things that your daughter was struggling with and what Laird was struggling with, you know, with the pandemic and the lockdowns. I don't think that we, and I'm not an expert in this field, but I don't think we've even seen all the ramifications of right. that. And same yeah. with social media, right? Like we all dealt with bullying growing up, but now it's almost like it's amplified where you can't turn oh, away. Kids can't get away yes. from it. Yes. Because There's it's no everywhere way. on social media. Yeah. I remember one time we were out to dinner and my daughter looked at her phone and there was a whole email list or Snapchat thing going on in her class and they were all making fun of her just because she was the new person 
And Snapchat for people that don't have it, it disappears. So it's like, yeah. that's where a lot of predators are going on to Snapchat. Yeah. And then yeah. also that's where a lot of bullying happens because then there's no proof. It disappears. Right. Like, But yeah, it's just, it's so difficult in this world in this day and age for young people. And then now with drugs and fentanyl and all these and, things that are happening. And you can get it from Snapchat. You yeah. contact your dealers on Snapchat. Right. And again, there's no, it disappears. And so there's mm -hmm. no proof sometimes. And so, yeah. yeah, it's just, I'm so grateful that you're sharing these different things about your kids' struggles and what you all were going through, because it's so important for every single parent to know what's happening. And I think you and I talked about it and we'll talk about it more in this episode, but parents don't realize yeah. what an epidemic the fentanyl yeah. crisis is and, and that it's not there it's here yes it can happen to anyone yeah i really didn't get that you know i saw i read the news i'm a really big reader of news i, I don't like to watch it <laughs> i would read these news articles and it would be adults and but have a kid in the back seat and they would have done drugs and they'd be completely zonked out in their cars and there's a, a toddler or somebody locked into the back seat. I would read about that, but it was so there and it was adults and it was rarely uh, highlighting teens and young people. And occasionally it would highlight an infant who had gotten into the parents' stash, but it really didn't talk about teen use and the why of it. And I definitely have theories, my theories, on the why of it. And a lot of it is based on my history with Laird and that it seems to be, be true when you start talking to people about, you know, teens, adults. Why did you decide to do that? You know, in, in our day, it was, oh, it's peer pressure. I wanted so-and-so to like me. But it's not that today. You know, and, and if we, the parents that grew up in the 80s and 90s, are still teaching about peer pressure, we haven't adapted to the new way. And we don't know. And that's super important. I didn't know what I didn't know. And, you know, I had this, this bright, smart, funny kid. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. That's bad. You know, he was saying all the right things. And we have a policy in the house that if you get into a bad situation when you're out with your friends, just give us a call, give us the secret word, and we will come get you. And you will be in far less trouble if you are altered and you are reaching out for help than if you didn't reach out for help. And we find out about it or something happens that definitely mitigates your in troubleness. Because after making a series of stupid decisions, you now have made a good decision. So the summer before, Laird is out and about. He's having the best time with his guys. I lived in a really nice house. So all the guys could come over and I always wanted to be the house where all the people were. You know, so the kids would bring their their friends. Uh, my daughter was still struggling with her issues at that time and with her social group at that time. So I was really focused on her mental health. And it appeared that Laird was doing great. He had guys. He would tell me and be happy and tell me all the time. Yeah, and now I'm having a great time. And I would see these guys and be like, oh, hey, it's you and it's you. And I love you guys. And you know, the, the ones that I love the best would like help around the house and make a point of saying hi and, you know, super awesome kid. And there was two kids that used to come by early days with a giant red truck. And Laird's dad said, that giant red truck, you never, ever get into that giant red truck. And unfortunately, a few weeks before Laird died, they died in that giant red truck from a series of bad decisions on their part on there was a police case on the police part and they lost their lives and it was awful. And that was last summer. 
And it was a really hard summer for parents in our small town area because we were losing kids that summer. And it was really hard. Unfortunately, the high school does not acknowledge the loss of students at all. There's nothing. At the beginning of the school year, prior to Laird's passing, maybe three weeks in, uh, a freshman uh, died of fentanyl. And there was nothing mentioned. There's no memorials. There's no let's talk about this. There's the standard line of, you know, grief counselors are available if you need to see them. No kid is going to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and where does that leave these kids who are three steps away, 10 steps away from that original kid, but are being affected? That's scary stuff. Yeah. There's also such a, a grief epidemic in our world, too, where people don't know how to talk about right. death. And especially when there's tragedy, right? I think that we're starting to scratch the surface on people having conversations about suicide. Whereas yeah. years ago, I mean, I'm a survivor myself because um, my grandfather committed suicide. Nobody would talk about it, right? It was like there right. were no resources. Now we're not in the perfect space, but people are more likely to talk about it. And it's so important for kids and for young people in order to process, but also to learn like, hey, this happened. I remember growing up you know, in the 80s and 90s and hearing stories about drug usage and like my parents would be like, oh, yeah, you know, so and so. That's what they did. And that was like a cautionary tale to me. And so I never wanted to touch stuff. And it's like, these are opportunities of learning and we need to grow awareness, find support systems for these kids. But really, like at the end of the day, we need to talk about it. Yeah, we need to talk about these individuals, but also too, like on the beautiful side of it, there's that quote where it talks about, you know, you die the day that someone stops using your name or stops talking about you. And it's like also on the positive, like Laird and all these kids were such beacons of light and they had friends and they'll always be a part of everyone else's story. And so even on the positive side, we need to talk about these kids that have been lost. Yeah. I lost my brother to mental illness 10 months before Laird died. So that was hard to go through and I didn't know how mentally ill he was until I got to his he lived in Port Lane, Idaho until I got there uh, with my oldest son to help his son clean everything up and have the memorial and you know take care of people and he was very very ill for him it was a relief to put down his burden and you're right people don't want to talk about suicide at all it's it's embarrassing and i'm like you know what if somebody is so distraught that that's their choice at least for my brother's case i have to support him in his choice i know that he had a rough life i know a little bit about the burdens that he had and i'm going to support his choice that's what he needed Mm -hmm. and he wasn't going to do the things that he needed to do to make a change. So that's what he needed. And sometimes, I mean, that's just it. And so I love him and I miss him. And this was the time of life that I thought that we would, you know, as our kids got older, that we would get closer and we would live in the same place and we would do all of our crazy brother, sister things again. And, and I keep thinking, oh, well, when Gareth gets here, he's not getting here. And and that kind of hits me again. But for Laird, it seemed like things were building to this unfortunate crescendo. So he started school in the 22-23 school year. And all that fall, you know, the little girl lost her life. She was 14, freshman. And he knew her. Her mother had given him rides. He had been at her house. She sent me a video of him teasing her you know and that was after he died and I didn't even know that he knew her really because I I said hey you know I heard I heard about this person and and he said I don't really know her I'm like what and then his mother says yeah no actually he did know her all these things so that was a surprise so that fall Laird was 
not going to school, couldn't get up for school. It was a really dark time for him. And, you know, as a parent, you're trying to, to walk that line of being supportive and you have to go to school. So I don't have to go to jail because there's that whole truant thing. And so he started turning things around in November, December. What grade was Laird in at that point? He was a sophomore. Sophomore. And he started seeing a girl who's just amazing, just fantastic. I absolutely loved her as his girlfriend, super close to her now and her family. And this has all brought us together very close. And, you know, she's she's a great human being and she was so good for him. And, you know, he stepped it up. And the original Laird, the the Laird with the bright, shiny eyes and the big grin started coming back. And I was like, oh, OG Laird is here. I don't have to worry anymore. And so that kept happening. His music kept getting better. You know, he's with this girl. She's over all the time. It's fantastic. And apparently that's when his drug use really stepped up again. I had no idea. I'm trained by the Ohio State Police Trainer who trains all of the police investigators in Ohio to identify when somebody is altered. And I have that from work. And it was it was a group training in person and we really went through it. I never saw my son altered. And I was looking. But I was looking for alcohol. I was looking for weed. I was not looking for fentanyl. And I wouldn't know what signs to look for. I wouldn't have known what signs to look for back then. So when it was June 30th, he said, hey, mom, I'm going to go spend the night at a friend's house. I'm like, okay, have a great time. And he stopped and talked to me. And he's like, hey, you know, I don't I don't know how to have friends and have a girlfriend. I'm like, okay, here's the thing. He sat and talked to me before he left for the night. And he took my car and I was fine with that. And I said, look, you cannot bring your girlfriend to a party and expect her to watch you play video games because that's really boring. You need to include her and not include her in video games. Find something that you guys can do together and make sure she's not just sitting there watching you play video games because that's dumb. And don't be that guy. And so, you know, he was really concerned that he wanted to be able to bring those two worlds together and give everybody their fair share of himself. So he left and it turned out that, well, he had a lot of movements that night, but I got a call from his dad the next day saying, Laird's dead. And I'm like, no, he said, no one's. He's not dead. He said, no, it's, you have the wrong information. And I went racing over there and there was cop cars out front. And this is the month leading up. So mm-hmm. this has all been very fresh and have been replaying it a lot. Um, for me right now, it's very, this time last year, he was alive. This time last year, I was, you know, laughing with him and having a great time and telling him to put gas in my car and, you know, tracking him on Life360, which, by the way, is another app that all parents should have. And they should buy the Life360 that you keep the tracking. Just get the membership. You need it. That's how we found his drug dealer's house. That's how we found all the drug dealer's houses. Because I had Life 360 and I gave it to the detectives. And they, they didn't have to go through his cell phone towers. They could see exactly where he was. And I got I got over to the friend's house. And there were cops there and there was paramedics there. I got to the top of the stairs. It was in a bedroom upstairs. And they wouldn't let me go any further. And... They wouldn't let me see him. And I found out later, a couple of months later, 
that the policy changed. One of the dads who's a doctor and has worked extensively in Ohio at the center of the fentanyl crisis in Ohio lit up the medics organization for not letting me see. And that policy has changed because of Laird's death. The parents can now see their children. And I spent the rest of the day watching the other kids that have been there that night get interviewed. I watched the bias of the cops. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? All these kids need to be treated equal with their kids. You don't get to choose this one kid and put him in the back of your car so he can write out his statement. And don't do that to anybody else. That's not okay. It's so traumatized. Like, right? They already have not been okay. through a trauma. And, they, and, and same I, with you. You know, it's like you've already been through a trauma. And a lot of times in these situations, then you don't the traumatize a kid. Yes. Just because of your bias. And talked with that mom. You know, because all the parents had to come pick up their kids. Yeah, and the family's house who who was at, I'm sure they're just, it's so distraught. It was the first time that they had been away and the kids had moved all the cameras so that they wouldn't see the kids were coming and going and you know, normal teenage stuff that ended in an absolute tragedy. And that's how these stories happen. It's normal teenage behavior until it isn't. And the kid that demanded that Laird and he go get drugs, Laird had saved his life the night before. He had OD'd the night before. And Laird saved him. And it was on video on Laird's phone. And I didn't find that for months. Because, you know, also kids, I don't know where to look on their phones. Because there's a massive difference between where kids put their stuff. And adults put their stuff. And I spent the rest of the afternoon after the kids left and they were waiting for the coroner to come pick him up. Just sitting outside with his girlfriend who came and his girlfriend's mother. I had alerted the people that needed to be alerted. If you want to be a part of the revolution and support the work we're doing to uplift women's voices and their stories, please consider donating to our 501c3 nonprofit organization. Every single dollar goes right back into the work that we're doing and will allow us to tell even more stories of inspiring women and girls to inspire and empower the next generation. Donate today at onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number onegirlrevolution.com. Gwen, something that just blows me away about you in this scenario, you know, you're sharing about your son dies suddenly and you're sitting there and you like stepped up to the plate and just started doing TV interviews and you were raising awareness almost immediately. And, and I, I want to affirm you in that because I can't fathom doing that, but it's also the power of mothers and the power of women that even in the darkest situations that they somehow can dig down five days. Like I can't even fathom that. Like you eat very easily. Gwen could have just closed yourself off to the world for this entire year and nobody would have questioned it. They would have been like, you know what? Gwen just needs time to just go through it because you were going through it. But instead you did so many multiple things. I mean, first of all, you shared the app, you were able to give access to the police. So they were able to identify the drug dealer. And then you started doing all these interviews. And I know there were op-eds and so many different things that were going on. Can you talk about that? Like, what was that in you that you were like, I need to stand up. I need to fight for Laird. I need to fight for other families. You're also living in this community that's almost constantly going through loss and you stepped up to the plate and started speaking. Well, being raised in the eighties, for me, it was all about activism. And so that nonprofit part of myself wanted to make this matter. 
I didn't want people to forget Laird and I didn't want them to be like, oh, well, that kid, you know, he did drugs. I couldn't stand that because Laird is so much more than that. He's so much more than a half a pill. And it was a half a pill because the other half was still in his wallet. And my thought was everybody needs to know this because I didn't know it. And if I didn't know it, then there's got to be a lot of other people that didn't know it, that didn't know this. And so the girl that had died of fentanyl at the beginning of the school year, her mom reached out and we started working together to get TV interviews and print interviews. And at one point, we had a fantastic story that were all of Laird's friends. And some of them had gotten clean and were night and day difference. Just beautiful kid once he was sober. Like glorious, the difference between before and after. And parents need to know. And they need to know that it's here in our little tiny towns. And it's not just down in Charlotte, in the bad neighborhood. It's right here in this sort of wealthy area where kids can get it. And quite frankly, the high school that my son went to, you can walk into any math class and get it still today. Because I reached out to the school district and I reached out to the principal and they wanted to deny it and sweep it under the rug. It wasn't important. And I said, look, you know, you've got this opportunity. You can make a difference here. And there continued to be overdoses in that school and other schools. But that school district was very slow to roll out their Narcan. And there was an internal memo that I had access to that said, okay, we're approved to roll out the Narcan. And that was in August. And by November, they still had it placed it in schools. And at this point, anybody can go down to the, in Charlotte, can go down to, I believe it's the municipal courts, and get free Narcan. And you can get a tag and carry it on your purse that says, I carry Narcan. So in an emergency, you're walking by somebody on the street and they're ODing, you can be there. And that happens. It absolutely happens. It happened to me in California and I didn't know it. And we are not educated and school districts will not educate you. So it's up to us. And we can sit here and say all we want. Hey, you know, it's not my kid. They're not doing it. But I'll tell you, because of this, my daughter started getting into drugs. Even after losing her brother, I had been going on the DEA website after Laird had died. And had learned how to search a teen's room the way the DEA do it. That's a lot different than the way I had been doing it. And I went and I searched her room their way, and I found all the stuff. And so we pulled her out of school and said she couldn't be friends. She couldn't go to that high school anymore where he had gone. She couldn't be friends with the friends that she was with. Just completely locked her down. And I reached out to the friend's parents and they're like, no, not my kid. I'm like, no, your kid. I've got pictures. Your kid. And now it hasn't even been a full year. It's been a school year. And two of those girls are doing math. And that's what happens. They look fine to us. Or, you know, kids will be kids. It's just a little alcohol. You know, I drank too. But the consequences... The DEA has a campaign, one pill can kill. They're not kidding. And it's not over there. It's right here, right here. And the amount of fentanyl that's needed to kill somebody is 0.2 milligrams. Two milligrams is fatal. And let me tell you, when these drug dealers are putting together the fentanyl into their fake street pills, whatever those street pills are, They are not the Walter White of mixing drugs. They are the Forrest Gump of mixing drugs. So one pill can be entirely fentanyl and one pill can not have any fentanyl in it at all. These are not evenly produced pills. So yes, one pill can kill. After this, Laird's 
pediatrician from the time he was born reached out to me and said, I'm so sorry, I'm putting this out to all of my doctor discussion boards. We're talking about it. And within two weeks, she lost two of her staff members, one staff member and one staff member's husband to fentanyl within two weeks. It's here. People need to open their eyes, Gwen. And like, as you're speaking, I'm like, oh, I need to go get, I feel like I need to go get trained and I need to get Norcan and have it on me because it is, it's an epidemic and we're not talking about it in the media. People don't think that it's happening in their own communities, in their own families. And it is, it's happening everywhere. And no matter what, no matter what you think, like, you know, even kids that are homeschooled, it's like, oh, well, my kid, I know I, it's all controlled, right? Like, I know who their friends are. I know you don't know. You, you don't, don't know. know. You think you know. You, you think you know. And so we need to know. be talking to our kids. We also need to be building community. We need to learn how to search rooms just like you did. Um, yeah. But also we need to do something. It's like you shared before. It's a different world than when we all grew up, right? It's not. That's the um, key takeaway. It's a different time. Everything is deadly. And quite frankly, fentanyl's day, while it's right here, what we need to be scared about is xylazine. Because that's coming and it's coming hard. And it used to be sort of isolated. And if you look up Kingston, Kingstown, I believe, Pennsylvania, it's a suburb or an area of, let's say, Philadelphia. And you will see the xylazine zombies. And these are people who have taken xylazine and they're just folded over, standing up, and they're just out of it. And you think you're watching a movie and it's real. And the epidemic is terrible. And when they inject this, it eats their flesh. It is, it is profoundly terrible. And that's what's next that's going to hit us. But really quick, let me tell you, in 2023, the DEA seized more than 80 million fentanyl-laced fake pills and 12,000 pounds of fentanyl powder. And that is equal to over 381 million lethal doses. And we are not talking about this every night in the news. And the reason that we're not talking about this is because the threshold is under 150,000 deaths. It's not enough because the American public is so desensitized that 150,000 deaths isn't going to make enough of a difference. And I think back to my childhood when MAD was created because one woman lost her daughter. And that's where all of us mothers come together. And I think that with the power of social media like TikTok and women realizing that it's just not our situation, it's every woman's situation. And we are coming together as women to say, oh, hey, we are half the planet and we have giant brains and we can do things and get things done that the moms need to come together and protect our children and your children and everybody else's children because the school districts aren't willing to talk about it. And the news makes it seem like it's over there, not right here. And parents are very good at turning a blind eye. I had no idea. And because I read my news and I don't look at the local news, I had no idea that there was a huge drug bust two weeks before my son died. And that was his dealer. And I had her house listed as house on my life 360 because he was there all the time. Well, I want to encourage every single parent who's listening to download that app. And like you said, pay for it, pay for it. the subscription because it's so, it's, it's so important. And I know with your own story, Gwen, the dealer ended up not being prosecuted, which is angry so, to me. Yes. So we have the teenager who is no longer a teenager. He's 18, who actually was interviewed by the police on Monday. July 3rd, 
The next day, he went out on his parents' boat on the lake, and his mom social media the crap out of it and said, oh, isn't this great? Family on 4th of July, and here's my son, and yay. And then two days later on Thursday, went to the quarry and went swimming, and yay, family, social media. And then on Saturday, shipped him back to England for eight weeks so that he couldn't be brought in for further questioning. What? Yeah. Yay, family. Our family's so great. Now, well, your child is responsible for my child's death. Mm-hmm. My child said, your child the night before. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I think that it's important for you to share those things too, because parents play a massive role in this, right? A massive Not, role. Massive role well, and also for justice being served. Here's the other part of it. The person that sold them the pills, they have it on camera. Here's the thing. They had the communication. I want to buy a pill. They had that in the phones. They had the cameras at the gas station. They had the dealer walk into the gas station, buy something from the gas station store, clear view, get into his car, clear view of the license plate, clear view of the deal door to door. And they didn't prosecute him. They arrested him for death by distribution, which is hard to get a warrant for death by distribution. And then within 36 hours, they had dropped the charges. They had dropped his bond from $100,000 to fifty thousand dollars, so he got out on five thousand dollars bail, and then the ADA sat us down and explained to us how he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the pill that killed him came from that dealer. And I'm like, "You dumbass! Are you saying that you're not good at your job, or this isn't high enough profile?" And the detective was in the room and a couple other people were in the room and they're all nodding along. And I'm like, no, none of this is okay. You have slam dunk here and you're not taking it. So what happened there? Yeah, there are so many shenanigans that went on there Mm -hmm. in the back room. Yeah. And there, there's like a longer, I feel like I could do a whole podcast episode on the justice system and the failures in these situations. And then that kid was shipped out of country. Kid. 21 that yeah. he was shipped out of country for nine months yeah the cover-ups in these types of situations it's like if someone did something wrong it, they need to own up to it and their families need to make sure that they own up to it but Gwen I one thing that I admire so much I admire so many things about you but because of your own experiences and a failed justice system you decided to take matters into your own hands and you started hashtag Justice for Laird and hashtag live for Laird. Can you talk about both of those campaigns? Absolutely. Justice for Laird is making sure that the laws are changed. One of the things that I immediately started doing after Laird died was reaching out to uh, Jeff Jackson, who is our representative, our North Carolina representative. And when he was the state attorney, he had been a big part of relaxing the laws for dealers and people who had been arrested, as long as they didn't have weapons charges as well. Well, I have to tell you, the drug dealer that my son was visiting, she had been arrested 17 times over the course of like eight years. And lots of it was for drugs. And some of it was for theft and stolen credit cards. But a clear criminal history. Well, her drugs killed at least two people that I know personally. And her mother is still dealing out of her house. And and the local vice, they know. But, you know, we're trying to get higher than that. So the first thing I did was reach out to Jeff Jackson to say, hey, you need to change. You need to unspool what you did. Move it back because this is the result. And you're worried about folks who are like, oh, I'm going to wake up after I got arrested for drugs, as opposed to I'm going to keep dealing because I don't care. And this person doesn't care. Now his district has been redrawn and he's running for North Carolina state attorney. I think he's a fantastic politician. I believe in him all the way. But he has an opportunity again 
and he has stated that fentanyl is part of his platform. DA Merriweather in Charlotte has said that he's going to start prosecuting more fentanyl related crimes. Like, really? Why don't we take the slam dunk that we got? Let's start there. I haven't heard back from DA Merriweather when I reached out to him. I did speak with Jeff Jackson's two of his staff members, but then didn't hear back from that. So that is the justice for Laird side is to make a difference in prosecuting and in the law. There's a lot of uh, fentanyl overdoses that are being prosecuted in other states successfully for death by distribution or their version of that. Live for Laird is the education part of that. And that is teaching parents that the drugs today are not the drugs of yesterday. That being altered on fentanyl, you know, on either side of the high looks different than being altered on marijuana or on alcohol. Um, and that it's important to it's important to learn them. It's important to learn how to search your kid's room. It's, you know, things may look right, but I tell you, I was really surprised when I bought an over-the-counter 16-panel test and had my daughter take your analysis. And I was heartbroken. Her brother had already died. And I'm looking at this. Just heartbreaking. And we have to step it up in terms of knowledge and, and the pressure that we put on our school systems to acknowledge that. I think it's important that we memorialize the kids that have died so that we can say, you know what, not only do we love them and they passed, but this is also what can happen. And, you know, make sure that that folks get the grief counseling that they need. I'm in a grief counseling group. I have been since probably a month after he passed, six weeks after he passed, and it has saved me. I only took two weeks off after he died and I ended up in the mental health uh, ward at my local hospital for a week at the beginning of April. And I had to take six weeks off from work because I had tried to push through. This is where all of us moms come together and we make the changes. We are the changes. And I think that we've started to hear our voices in the best, most positive way over the past maybe two years. And, you know, it's the blessing and the curse of social media. But thank goodness we are able to connect and I hope stay connected and really make change. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at One Girl Revo. That's the number one girl R E V O. We're on TikTok at One Girl Revolution. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel at One Girl Revolution. That's the number one girl revolution. You can find all of our social media links, previous podcast episodes, our Emmy nominated documentary series, and more on our website at OneGirlRevolution.com. That's the number one girl revolution.com. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, everybody's story is different, but when I look at mothers and I think about all of the things that have changed in a positive way in our world, it's oftentimes led by mamas who are working to protect their children and working to be a voice for the voiceless. You know, I know that Laird is not able to, to speak, but he's speaking through you and through the work that you're doing. And you know, you share there are so many different facets to the fentanyl epidemic, and it really starts with us sharing our voices, using social media to raise awareness. You know, there's a whole mental health component there. We need to be talking about mental health component for these kids, right? For these kids, they don't start taking drugs because somebody pressured them into it necessarily like we did in our day, but rather because there's something missing. There's a hole in their heart from something, from somewhere. Something's missing. And they're trying to fill that because we don't have adequate mental health resources. And we're not going to have adequate mental health resources for a very long time. So we have to identify 
the hole and know that there's a huge chance that hole is going to be filled by something that can hurt them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And having resources for young people, having resources for parents, bringing people together, you know, the whole grief side of it, there are not enough resources for grieving parents, for grieving friends, for grieving siblings. Like there are so many different facets to this. Then you talk about the justice system, the legal system. I mean, there's so, there's so much that you covered in your, your own story covers, but from my perspective, and that's what this podcast is all about is it starts with us. We can all do something. We can use our social media. We can look for signs. We can also just create safe spaces where people can feel, I loved what you shared before about your kids, where it's like, you have a policy that they can call you at any point from wherever they are and just will come pick you up. You're not going to be in as much trouble as you would be if we find out that you did something, but that's such an important lesson for parents because we, we can be the catalyst for change in all these different ways. Gwen, I want to ask you what's next for you and the work that you're doing and how can we get involved? How can we support the work that you're doing and how can we raise awareness on this, on this critical epidemic? Uh, what's next for me is, um, is working with the successful school districts that have developed these education programs to learn how they've made it successful and how it's replicable so that we can start getting support and, and get that lobbied through our education system at a national level and break it down at a local level. And if we can get rallied support, grassroots of parents saying, hey, I want this program in my school to teach my kids from grade school through high school, not just on Red Ribbon Week, but all the year about drugs and alcohol and um, all of the dangers, but in a realistic way. Don't just get up there, our school district just got up there and said, don't vape, it's a gateway. And how many kids are vaping their heads off right now? And, you know, it's true that they can get cartridges for marijuana and it's dosed with fentanyl. They can die from a vape, but it's not effective. So my next step is, is to work with the school districts that have developed effective education and start from the grassroots movement to roll it up and make the demand for it and then work with the mamas to get the legislation to change to say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to use this. That's the next step is education. There's outstanding states like California and Texas, randomly enough, that are prosecuting for death by distribution. And they are shining light in this fight against fentanyl. Yeah, that's so important to look at the states, look at the school districts that are doing it. If your school district isn't doing something on this, or even I would say to parents or individuals, call yeah. your school district and yeah. ask them what they're doing, because mm -hmm. they're some of them are probably not even thinking about it. And it's like the yeah. squeaky, yeah. what is it? The squeaky wheel gets the oil. It's like, yeah. we have to be using our voices. We have to be using social media. We have to be using our voices to say, demand it, demand that there needs to be something done in our mm -hmm. own school districts, in our own communities. And so ask the question, what's being done? Gwen, for parents that are out there who are listening, I know you mentioned an app on multiple occasions. What advice would you give to parents? Please share the name of that app again so people can download it. And then also, like, what are resources that you have found that would be good for these parents? So Life360 is an app and that is downloadable on your child's phone. And yes, they can turn it off, but my kids would get in trouble when they did. And I also share my location with my kids because communication goes both ways. And when you get the paid version, not only do you get to keep your history of where you've been and how long you were there and from what time to what time, but, and this is great for parents of teens, you also can see how fast they were driving. And if they had any heartbreaking, if they were in an accident, if they used their phone while they were driving. So these are key, key elements, and it's very inexpensive. And it's certainly worth the investment. I've also turned to the DEA website, uh, dea.gov, 
and they have uh, resources for parents there. And it includes some videos on how to search your kid's room the DEA way. What I learned is to feel the stuffed animals because a lot of times kids will hide their stuff inside the stuffed animal. Didn't know that before then. You know, kids have caps, ball caps. Look inside the band of the ball cap. Never would have thought of that. A lot of things can be hidden in there. Um, so just a couple of things. And, you know, a big one in my household was open those uh, water bottles and make sure you know what's inside. So, yeah, that was um, that was really key. Parents need to be educated. They need to be asking questions, of course, talking to their kids, but also, like you said, you know, be aware of the different things going on and how to look for signs and also just how to look around their room or look in water bottles and know that kids need support. They're just kids. They need they support. Just, they need they don't parents. Know the risk. Their prefrontal lobes are not developed enough. And, you know, if done in a kind way, drug test them. Be safe for yourself. Be safe for your kids. Always carry Narcan. Narcan can last up to one to two years after its expiration date. And get a little tag that is on your backpack, that's on your purse, that says, I carry Narcan. Keep it in your car. Keep it in your house. Have multiple packs of it everywhere. Have your kids carry it. Because they're going to be the ones out with their friends who may or may not be overdosing. And I'm thinking of that night before my son died. And he was calling his friends going, what do I do? What do I do? He's too scared to call the police. In in all of my research, if you call the, the 911 and say, my friend is overdosing, you're not going to have to worry about being caught by the cops. If your friend dies, you will be brought up on charges for not aiding your friend. So that's the difference. And I think that kids don't know that. It is more important to call 911 and you're not going to get in trouble for whatever drugs you guys just did because it's all about saving a life. But if your friend dies and you didn't render aid and you're there, you will be brought up on charges. Now, the difference between that sort of active situation and what Laird went through, his last words were to his best friend, hey man, thanks so much for having me. I had the best night of my life. I'm going to go to bed now. And he meant every word of it. He adored his friends. He particularly adored that friend. And he went up, he went in the guest bedroom, and he went to sleep. He took that half a pill and he died. And it was about 3.30, 3.45 in the morning. They would not be in trouble because he didn't actively die in their presence. But if the night before that boy had died in my front seat of the car, while my son didn't know what to do, then he would have been in trouble. That's the difference. So... Being proactive and making kids know that, sure that they know that, that it's better to call 911 instead of four of your friends to say, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah, those are key things. And in some households, it can be really tough. Your personal beliefs can be very conservative and you just don't believe in that sort of thing. But do you want live kids or dead kids? That yeah. those sometimes will end up being your choices. And sometimes you have the best household in the world and everything is going right and you still end up losing your kids. Well, and oftentimes it might not even be your kid that's doing it, but it might even just be another kid that's staying over the night or yeah. somebody coming to visit you as well. I'm thinking about Norcan. It's like, oh, we unfortunately we live in a world where everyone should just have it at their house. Yeah. And yep. just in case, because you don't know, we don't know, you know, you might have a friend come visit and stay with you for a couple of days and maybe uh, who knows, who knows? So you, it's and always I, good to I be have prepared. friends who after Laird have started stashing Narcan everywhere and have had to use it. Wow. And they had no idea that, that it would be in their household. Yeah. So that's just such an important public service announcement to everyone who's listening, but also 911. Call 
call 911. Yeah. Teach your kids. I know that that we teach our kids to call 911 if certain things are happening, but if they're at a party with friends and something starts happening, call the police, call 911. That's what they're there for. They're there for these types of situations. And so yep. I just encourage all parents who are out there and and everyone, if even, you know, we all know people who might be struggling. So share this, share this conversation, share this episode, share the story of yep. Lauren and Laird and talk about it because this is how we're going to change it is with awareness, but also each and every one of us doing something. And it really starts with something as simple as sharing this episode of the podcast and using your voice to raise awareness. So yeah. When I am just so honored that you are sharing your story, that you were on this podcast, Laird's legacy continues to go on through you and through the work that you're doing. And I can't wait to see where you go from here and all the people that are helped through you sharing your own story. And I want to encourage everybody who's listening. We all have a story, each and every one of us. And sometimes there are painful, difficult things that happen in our life and it's important that we share those things though, because you never know who it might be able to help. And so I'm so grateful that you've shared your story, that you're raising your voice or continuing to raise awareness and share your story and Laird's story. And I can't wait to see where you go from here. But before I let you go, Gwen, I always end this podcast on two questions. So first of all, you are a one girl revolution. You are a woman who is changing the world every single day. But I'm curious to know who is a one girl revolution in your life? Who's a woman or girl that inspires you? I have two. Okay. Um, Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. I think that Hillary Clinton has universally been the smartest person in the room in just about every room that she's ever been in. And because she is outspoken, and I admire that so much, but uh, I think that it's been very challenging in her lifetime that, you know, she's the one that's, that's breaking the ice for us. She's the first one that's getting out there and challenging the status quo of being the smartest woman and not sitting down. And I just admire that so much. Uh, the other is Michelle Obama. She is, she's the definition of class to me. She is so smart. She has raised a terrific family. She admits when it was really hard and that, she, you know, times were just tough because raising small kids, it's hard and things were not easy. And then, you know, her time in the White House and all of the great things that she did and the stuff she had to go through to do the great things. She is amazing. You know, publicly, she has kept her cool, and I am so impressed with her and how much that she has done, and so graciously, and also another woman who is the smartest person. I really admire both of them. I keep seeing memes or I guess videos on Instagram, different reels and memes of Michelle Obama. And she is always so classy and has so so much wisdom for, for women yeah. and girls. Yeah, I, I see these little clips and I get takeaways every time. I'm like, okay, and I'm going to get that one. I'll take that little bit of knowledge. Thank you very much. <laughs> so absolutely. Well, and you are just a beacon of light like that, Gwen. So you are you are such an uh, inspiration. And, and I feel like there's so much wisdom jam-packed into this podcast episode. But before I let you go, I always end this podcast because we focus on women and girls and really strive to encourage every single woman and girl to be the the one girl revolution that they were created to be and change the world through their lives. But I'll ask you, if you could leave women and girls around the world with one message, what would it be? Join together, join together, make that difference, but don't be separated from your sisters. There's nothing we can't do together. We are stronger together. And I know that you sure. are raising up an army, Gwen, through your own story and through all the mamas who are standing with you to raise awareness on and and make change, honestly, for on this so. epidemic. So. And so I can't wait to continue to follow everything that you're doing. Thank you again, Gwen, thank for being so on much. the podcast. And thank you for all the great thank work you. that you do. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. 
For more from One Girl Revolution, to listen to all of our podcast episodes, watch our Emmy-nominated documentary series, follow us on social media, donate to our nonprofit organization, and more, please visit onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number one girlrevolution.com. Thanks.